Hi, everyone. We'll get started in just two minutes, giving a couple of minutes more for people to enter the room. Thanks for your patience. We'll be right with you. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it is my real pleasure um, to have with us Oz Scott. Uh, we have a very dear mutual friend in common, so uh, Felicia Henderson. So I knew I was going to like him even before I met him, but he surpassed my best expectations. And I'm sure that this conversation will surpass all of yours as well. Um, and, you know, we wanted the part of the focus of this conversation to be longevity in the uh, business and, and as a TV director, because one remarkable thing about Oz, and we'll go deep and we're like, going to ask a lot of questions about how he got there and how he did this, but is he has an amazingly diverse and uh, long career. And, you know, kudos to you, man. So um, I'm going to start by going back. And I, I'm in researching you, I read that. Um, because your dad was in the army, you lived abroad until you were 12 years old in Germany and Japan. And I'm just wondering, um, do you feel like that early childhood experience of living not in America, but abroad uh, changed your worldview? And if so, how it changed your worldview? Um, it probably did. I mean, I lived in Japan. I was five, six, seven years old. And I was in Germany, 11, 10, 11, 12. Um, got to see a lot of different things, but we were, you know, our father, my father was military. And so we were in some ways isolated on the base, though when we were in Germany, we did play with the German kids. They cheated at soccer, we cheated at football, you know, and we just <laughs> alternate. I mean, that's how you did it, you know, sleeping out overnight. You could tell a police, you know, police jeep, jeep after a 12 o'clock curfew, you could tell them a mile away. So, you know, I learned a lot of things, so. We, it was fun. I mean, I traveled, you know, my father, my parents took us to Egypt. They took us to the Holy Lands. They took us to Turkey. We went to Italy, you know, on the weekends, my mother would want to go to Paris to go shopping. And my brother and I back then said, leave us some food. We're going to stay here. But, so, so I think we got, it just was fun, you know, and, and and, and coming back to the United States, we left, we left when TV wasn't really jumping, you know I mean? We came back in the 60s when for three years I was playing with kids outside all the time. When I got back to the United States, it was weird. All the kids were inside. Watching, watching TV. TV. Yeah. yeah. And so, so what did you think about that? Were you romanced by TV or did you want to watch to in order to fit in? What was your reaction to this strange new world that you found yourself in? I, no, I wanted to play. I wanted to be outside. I, 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 wanted to be, I wanted to be with the other kids. I think for me, what I love about television, what I love about theater, what I love about film, because I think I'm, you know, I'm all of that is I love the stories. I love who we are as people. You know, the one thing I always say, our lives are full of specifics. Mm. You know, the 
one concern that a lot of people have when when writers come out to Hollywood to be writers is you know I mean uh, Stephen Bochco and always had this 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 conversation. He said, "I don't believe anybody has anything to write about until they're over 25, mm. because they're pretty much <laughs> writing about their parents, <laughs> parents and their friends." Yeah. And if you look at Eugene O'Neill, what did he write about? He wrote about his, his drunk mother and his drunk father. I mean, um, he happened to write about it really you, well. So that's, yeah. And he wrote about it very well, but you grow. You do grow. I mean, you grow into, but for me, what life for me is my friends are doctors and lawyers and, and, and the candlestick makers and Indian chiefs. And, you know, I just, I think that's what I bring to my art. Mm -hmm. is I bring those experiences. I bring playing outside. So um, let me, you know, go back to that a little bit. So like, I know that your uh, first sort of attraction to the arts was through theater. That was sort of your first love. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, and I so, would say theater. So what, 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 how did, how did that happen? What ignited you about theater? Was it a particular play you saw or read or, you know, was it Shakespeare? Like what, what lit your theater fuse? Well, you know, I mean, I, I will say I was always a history buff and that's something that's always interesting because I was, I loved watching old movies and, and those historical dramas. Those, those were fascinating to me. So watching Robin Hood, watching King Arthur, watching all that was all fascinating because I loved all of that. But I think for me, when I was in high school, I had a teacher who had a theater, a theater appreciation class and she would take us to plays. Mm. And I will say one year I saw Hal Holbrook's Mark Twain. I saw Christopher Plummer in The Royal Hunt of the Sun. All these are on Broadway. I saw the original, the original Man of La Mancha oh, yeah. that was on the site of where the NYU library is today. It was this big Quonset Hut theater look. I saw Murat Saad. Oh, wow. And my mother actually took me to the closing night of A Hand is on the Gate, which was, um, a play, that was a poetry that Roscoe Lee Brown put together. And Roscoe and I became very close later on. And I think um, Hand is on a Gate really affected me. And I think for colored girls- how, how did it affect you? I think just, just the actors and the poetry and how they put it together, I was, there was a double album that anytime I would go by a used record store, I would go in and see if I, I think I played it to death. And I think I went through five copies of it because I just, I just loved all those poems. I loved, it was Cicely Tyson, Gloria Foster, mm -hmm. Josephine Premise, Ellen Holly. It was, um, the men were uh, Moses Gunn, Leon Bibb, Roscoe Lee Brown and James Earl Jones. Wow, your memory is shockingly good. That was amazing. Yes. Um, so, all right. So, so you fell in love with theater, you know, as a lot of people do. I did. We talked about this a little before we went live. That I'm also a theater rat from way back. But um, when, how did you envision that this might be actually something that you could earn a living at? And how did you take that inkling that this might be something you could earn a living at into actually making it something. That That's interesting that you even use the words earn a living at. <laughs> I didn't realize I could earn a living at it until, woo, maybe 15 years ago when my accountant showed me my um, retirement. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I, was, I was enjoying it. I was, you know, I was into it. I mean, honestly, if I didn't have a wife, I probably wouldn't have bought a house. You know, I just right, would have, right. you know. Just lived for your art, right? Yes, yes. And and that is something that's very important to me, which is my art. I never thought about it as earning a living as much as this is what I was able to do and I was able to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. um, every June, I would go back to the O'Neill Playwrights Conference and just work with actors and work with writers for the month. And my agents were always saying, wait a second, wait a second, TV season is starting up. Right. July is, July is the, that's the month that 
we can get you work, we can get you work. And I'm like, no, I'm going to the O'Neill. So the entire 90s, I went to the O'Neill and I worked on plays and I got $100 a week. And it fed your soul, right? It fed my soul. Yeah. Which is, you I know, think, I, important to make art. You have to feed your soul, not just your, you know, not just the piggy bank. You have to, right? Yeah. I mean, so, so, and it's not that I, I wasn't thinking about earning a living, but I don't think it was that important to me. You know, I figured. What about your parents? Because, all right, so, you know, again, bringing it back to me, but like, you know, I graduated with a degree in dance and theater with a minor in writing. And then my parents were like, go to law school, which I did. Um, you know, they, they'd been very supportive up until that point. And then they were like, you know, go get a real career. Did you get any of that pushback? Or did I just have pushy parents? My father, just remember, I always, I always joke and say that um, I followed my father into the, into the entertainment business. He was a preacher. No, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did he appreciate that though? I don't know. <laughs> I think he did actually. He did because he's, you know, he even one, one Sunday when I was in my thirties, he said, I want you to preach the, the, the Father's Day sermon. And I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. That's cool. Can I go to the, to the big pulpit? Can I get up in the video? He said, yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but no, I think my parents, my mother, my father actually taught all the chaplains in the military, in the, in the US Army from 19, my, my daughter found this out, I didn't know, but from 1946 until 1959. I mean, we did three years here and three years there that he went away, but he taught. He taught the rabbis, he taught the imams, he taught the priests, he taught the, you know, the ministers, you know, about um, the theology. And so for him, he was, you know, he was a thinker. My mother taught elementary school up in Larchmont and um, the president of NBC at the time, donated all the old camera equipment to yeah. the school and they did their own today show. I mean, so, and my father, when he taught, there is a magazine article in Ebony where he was one of the first teachers to use video cameras to, to, to teach with uh, interesting. remote learning. And so they were, they were, they were avant-garde in their own way. So they thought it was cool too. Well, that's good. I'm imagining a lot of our uh, viewers are kind of like, I wish my parents were cool. They're all telling me to go to dental school, right? Of course. Um, <laughs> so um, when you fell in love, you so you fell in love with theater, and so, but why, why directing? Why was that your draw rather than acting or producing? What was it about directing that spoke to you? I, I, I was, uh, I, I started. I got my first professional job at Arena Stage with a company called Living Stage. It was an improvisational theater company. Um, I was the kid who had the broom, who was sweeping up, and Very they would they let me do improv. It was a company that did eight weeks of improvisational rehearsals, six days a week, ten to twelve hours a day. And kid, after you finish sweeping up, you can you can join the actors and be part of the rehearsals, which I did. And after about two weeks doing that, the stage manager dropped out and they said, hey kid, I was like 19 years old. They said, hey kid, do you wanna take that job? And I was like, oh wow, you know? And I was sort of like, uh, put the revolution on hold. I got a job that was paying me $192.50. And as a basketball player I said, you wanna share this penthouse with me? And I was like, wow, that's going, that would be cool. But eight weeks later, you know, it was, back to zero, but um, <laughs> but for me, I stage manage and stage managing was very important for me in the improvisation, improvisation world because as a stage manager, you give notes when the director's not there, you, you keep the show alive. How do you keep an improv show alive? Mm, interesting. So I had to sit there and go, um, Yo, I didn't know how you got into that improv because I didn't feel it. Mm -hmm. you know, I'd give notes like that. They were very personal and very detailed and very, you know, I, I found that it was very interesting how I would, because it became very a, a psychological experience. Mm -hmm. I found that I was good at it. Mm -hmm. And the director left us alone on the road for three months. And for three months, 
you know, after I'd clean up and do that, I'd give notes to the actors and I'd say, that worked, that didn't work. You know, how are we going to get this better? Mm. Age managing was a real entree for me because we took a play, the Taking Miss Janie to, 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 to. I hope that's not me. No, it's me and I don't know why it's on. My apologies, my bad. Okay, uh, so I took, we took this play, The Taking This Journey at the Lincoln Center. Sam McMurray was a friend of mine at the time. And Sam was, I actually sort of put my, Sam's mother, Jane Hoffman, was a big actress. And I remember years ago, I remember vouching for Sam and saying to Gilbert Moser, the director, I really think Sam would do this part, but he's in, he's in California and he can't afford to fly in. And Gilbert said, you really think he's good? I said, yes. Okay, if he's not, I'm gonna fire both you and him. I said, <laughs> okay. So he came, Sam came in and Sam survived. He, he, you know, he did very well, but there was a point when we got to, to Lincoln Center, as we started at Henry Street, we moved to Lincoln Center, that Sam came to, you know, Gilbert Moses came to me once, and this is a lesson I, I really try to tell people. And he said to me, he came back after two weeks and he looked at the play and he said, Oz, what have you been doing? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I said, I'm the stage manager. I'm supposed to keep the play exactly where you left it. And he said, yeah, you've kept it just where I left it and it hasn't grown. Mm, interesting. And I said, oh, you know, so Sam came to me that week, later that week when Gilbert had left and said, Oz, I'm still having a problem. Even though we've been doing this for a couple of weeks, I'm having a problem with this part. And so I called a rehearsal with him and he and I rehearsed it and worked on it. And about a week or so later, Gilbert came back and Gilbert went up to Sam and said, oh my God, you've grown, that's great. Never said, never, never said a word to me, but I knew that I had helped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I loved Gilbert for that because he said, I, you're here. You know, this is a play. A play is a live experience. And as a live experience, it's got to keep growing. It just can't get stagnant. Okay. Right. And something I've learned throughout my career, you know, it's like, I tell actors, you know, I'm not up on the stage. I'm not the one who's making myself look good or bad. I've got you this point, but you've got to find out where it's going. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying change it, don't flip it, but live it and breathe it and find out where it's gonna take you because every night it's gonna be something different. That's what we love about live theater. It's not exactly the same. It's great listening to you talk about that because you have such a clear passion in your voice and such a clear excitement when you talk about working, you know, with the actors. I mean, you, you know, you just light up. So it's really great because I can you can tell that you love that aspect of your job. So I'm going to ask you a, a flip side, which what is the thing that you don't like about directing? Is there anything that you don't like? Um... I guess I don't like dealing with the limitations. I mean, it's fun in some ways. I was just telling somebody today, um, they told me, um, Oz, we've got these six eighths of a page that you gotta shoot, but you can't have this one actor. You gotta shoot in a way that you don't see it. And I said, hey, it's like playing golf. You know, the, the better golfers are the ones who, I'm in the rough, how do I get out? So for me, it's always a challenge. Uh, okay, let me figure out how to make this, get out of this. Um, what's what I love about it is, what I hate about it, it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. What I love about it, it's not perfect. You mm -hmm. know, I think we're constantly given these challenges and a lot of times the challenges are very frustrating, but you've got to be careful to, to, to not let the frustration take you over. Right. Um, and, and, well, I think and, there's a, something beautiful about that Japanese concept of wabi-sabi, of finding the beauty in the imperfection, right? I, that, particularly yeah. in a live experience in which I think that's part of it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's by design a less controlled experience and something, you know, that's film content, which you can control down to the frame, right? And have multiple you can choices. control it down to the frame, but even then I, I, I'll, I throw a little mistakes in my cutting <laughs> in my film and you know, I'll see if anybody can catch it. I, <laughs> you devil one you. Of the, one of the things that, um, 
I realized early on, you know, everybody, you know, my daughter is directing now. And then she was saying, okay, dad, explain to me crossing the line, crossing the line, crossing the line. And I'm like, okay, you're over right shoulder here. You're over there, left shoulder. But let me tell you something about editing, about film, about all of that. If it's interesting, if your audience is enjoying it, rules go out the window. And if, and I didn't realize it as much as I've watched The Wizard of Oz, and I, we've all watched The Wizard of Oz over and over and over and over again. It was when I started becoming a filmmaker that there was a point where I was watching The Wizard of Oz one night, and this is, you know, and they, they cut from the four of them to a shot of five of them with the wizard and everybody had changed places. <laughs> and it's the worst cut, it was the worst continuity, but guess what? No one as cares. many times as I've watched that movie, as many times as people watch it, do you care? You're into it, you're into it. And if you're not, that's a problem. That takes you out of it when you're not into it and there's a bad cut. Um, I saw that I remember watching the Jackie Gleason show years ago and they cut from two angles that you're from a three shot to a three shot. I mean, cameras that close together, it's a jump cut. It's just, it's always going to look bad. Right. I was laughing so hard. Right. I saw it was a bad cut, but I didn't care. Right. It was funny. Well, I mean, I think that a, I would say that it's important to know the rules so you know how to break them, right? Because Absolutely. I think like something like crossing the line, for example, can really affect the mood of an audience. You can do things that will, you know, make them feel unsettled by the use of camera. I think crossing the line is one of those things, right? So I think it's about controlled, um, you know, controlled mayhem, maybe, is what. <laughs> but yes and no. I mean, I'll, I, there's times when I'm watching a show and I can't tell that they cross the line, even though I look at it, I said they cross the line, but it feels comfortable and natural. So, you know, I just think rules are definitely important and, just, and there's reasons for rules. There are reasons. Going from a close-up to a close-up crossing line is can be very jarring because then it looks like they're not looking at each other. Right. But from a medium shot to a wide shot, eh, you know, let's, Hey, you know, it's, 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 I got to get out of my day. So. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about your uh, segue from theater into film and how that happened, how you made that leap from your early love of theater into TV and film. Well, I mean, for me, it was actually where I'm at right now. Yes. I have a picture of New York. I just wanted everybody to feel a little homesick with all that snow there, but um, I'm in New Orleans right now. And actually it happened while I was here in New Orleans. I had done for Colored Girls on Broadway. Um, we had started the tours and a friend of mine asked me to help work on a documentary. And so I said, fine, you know, I, did I know what I was doing? No, but that's a whole nother story. But you know, you just have to learn. It's learning that's on the okay. job. That's the best way to begin, knowing nothing and plunging in, not knowing what you don't know. So, uh, so I was down here working on this documentary and I was making up as I was going along because there were problems and it was, it was great. It worked out. And I got a phone call from Universal. I think it was from Sean Daniels saying, we've got this picture with Richard Pryor and Cicely Tyson. Would you like to come and do it? And I, of all the things I learned at NYU, the most important thing was the line, oh, I have to read the script. <laughs> and of course, and you know, so I gave that line, hung up the phone and screamed to my wife, hey, you know. <laughs> so they, 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 they messengered me the script. I read the script and the next day I said, okay. And so they flew me actually straight here from New Orleans, from New Orleans to, to Hollywood. They put me up at the Sheraton Universal overlooking the Valley in, in Universal. I called my friends up. I said, come on, I got a limo. I got some champagne, you know, and one of my friends put his arm around me and we stood over there looking over Universal over the Valley. And he said, just remember one day, this all still won't be yours. <laughs> which is, you know, which is a good lesson. You gotta, you gotta realize that, you know, 
watch watch who you are and 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 i kept my friends like that and then he proceeded to go looking for the the last black director who had done a film to see if his initials were carved in any of the furniture but um <laughs> but back then there was one black director every two years doing a film we were that was the late 70s black exploitation was over it was before the independent film movement really kicked in with spike lee and all that so i was it was me i was the only black director doing a film so that. Why do you think you got, sing not that I doubt that you should have been, but why do you think that you got kind of anointed like that? It's like, the I, mean, I, think, I think, you know, for Colored Girls was a major factor. Um, I, I was, hey, I'm the, I was the golden child for, you know, the moment, you know, it's like, that's something that a young person gets. They get that moment of being the golden child, being, you know, and they love the golden child. They love discovering. They love to say, I discovered them. I mean, it's it's interesting. I think once I got it, got started to get experience, once I started getting in there, sometimes it was harder for me to get those films because they're always looking for that young kid that they can they can actually push around and they can sit there and you know. And I did go up to Tom Mount, who was who had become president of the Universal at one point, and I said, Tom, you screwed me. He said, "Oz, we screw all first-time directors. You'll know better next time." <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he was candid with you. You got to appreciate the honesty, right? Yeah. Um, so, were there any? Um, we talked a little bit about what plays you saw that kind of lit you up in that year. That was sounds like it was very influential. Um, and you talked a little bit about watching historical films. But were there any other um, directors or films that when you were that you either that while you were growing up or when you started to work that you thought, man, that's cool. I'd like to be like that. Or I'd like to, I, I love what that director's doing. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were definitely, there was, you know, it was, um, oh God, uh, a friend of mine's father, Pet, Pet, uh, Petri, he was um, a big film director. And what I loved about his work was it was eclectic. You know, he was doing different things and I always wanted to do different things. I didn't want to, to get stuck in um, you know this genre, I like comedy. I love comedy, and and it's so funny when I got the Jeffersons. I remember doing something, and my assistant director looked at me and said, "But Oz, why are you doing it?" And yes, when I was watching those historical films, I was also watching the Three Stooges. I was watching you know all of the, all of the comedies back then. And what I found was there's things in comedy that transcends time, that transcends color, that transcends it all. And I think I brought a lot of that to my work. And for me, you know, doing the Jeffersons, I remember doing the classic Sherman walks in, Isabel walks in, Roxy walks in, they all walk in and boom, 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 boom. They, they you know, he stops and they, and, they, and my, my, assistant director said, but Oz, Oz, that's just corny. It's been done. And I said, it's funny. <laughs> funny. And the next year that was in the title sequence. I mean, right. it, it's it's, because things are, have been around because they work. Yeah. And, 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 and I'll tell you, one of the greatest moments on the Jeffersons was we did a, Isabel had taken over bar and there was a motorcycle club gang with old guys and they had hired all these old Catskill comics <laughs> and funny. during our breaks it was Ron, it was Ron Shelton and, and it was um, uh, 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 Adams what's his name uh, who was Get Smart his brother was a big comedian back then they all sat around and they just told stories and for me the breaks were like oh my god I can't wait to get to a break so I felt like I was I was in the middle of Broadway Danny Rose because they were and they talked comedy and they talked the the and they and, and they taught me things in, in when I listened to them and they were talking about uh, you know how this one comic had this thing and this one comic had this thing and one guy told the story about the comic who he went to see him in Vegas and accidents happened and accidents happened and accidents happened and he was just he was on it he was on it and he said he went back the next night to see what else was going to happen. And he said the same accidents happened each and every time, exactly the way they did the night before. And he said, I went to him and I said, 
but, 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 and he said, hey, kid, if it works, keep it. Did but it's, it's things like that that I learned. You know, I learned things from my, my stand-up who would open up, the, open up and he would, for our shows for us, and he was saying, I used to do boats, and I remember one time they weren't getting my jokes, and I pushed harder and harder, and I realized they were, I was pushing them away, and so the next night, if they didn't get it, I just stayed right where I was. I didn't go to them. I let allowed them to come to me. And these little lessons w were fascinating, and I just learned from them because, yeah, don't push it. Because what if you start pushing, you push them away. For me, every 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 part of our day is a life lesson, and it's a life lesson that we take into our work. So, um, talking about your work, and I know you mentioned the Jefferson, and I'm going to have to read this because I had to write these down. There were so many pieces of American culture, like just things that have informed our really our our, our social dialogue. Um, so I'm going to. This is a partial list. Um, so Hill Street Blues, The Jeffersons, The Cosby Show, Northern Exposure, Party of Five, Soul Food, Allie McBeal, Lizzie McGuire, CSI, NCIS, all of the initial shows I think you hit, um, Blue Bloods, Criminal Minds, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Black Lightning. I mean, this is just incredible because, you know, it's drama, it's procedurals, it's comedy, it's sci-fi, right? It's, I mean, which That's I awesome. already find astounding in a business that tends to want to pigeonhole people. Um, but I wanted to know a couple of things. One, do any, did have any of the shows that you've worked on meant something particular to you, either personally or professionally? Um, anything that was a particular moment for you? The last one. Which one? Black Lightning that I said? No. Last, whatever the last one was, it was Swamp. Oh, whatever the last one was. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's always, it's, I'm, I, it, for me, it's what I'm doing now. You know, it's it's what you know what I just did. Um, I try not to look back too much. Um, uh, I mean, for me, okay. You know, when you talk about iconic moments, what I loved was when Entertainment Tonight started. I had two pieces in their credits for the first two years. Wow! I had Busting Loose with the Ku Klux Klan, and I had for Color Girls. Mm -hmm. You know, we're part of what they felt were was you know Americana was entertainment. Mm -hmm. So that you know, of course, for color girls meant a lot to me. I think Cheetah Girls meant a lot to me. Um, uh, Hill Street Blues was my first one. Archie Bunker, you know, I, I learned a lot from that. I think there's a lot of those. You know, working with some of these actors, Carol O'Connor, working with Robert Downey Jr. on Alec McBeal. Anne Heche, I did, I did one episode with four people who were just absolute, you know, Tay Diggs and, and Nicole Carson, they were just brilliant. And, and I, I just, you know, Anne Heche was phenomenal. Robert Downey Jr. was phenomenal. I think I look back at some of those episodes, the practice, working with David Kelly, you know, it's funny, I was doing the, I was doing, pick, I did picket fences and one of the executives years later said to me, Oz, I was executive on Picket Fences. Which one did you do? And I said, the best one. <laughs> he said, did you do the Christmas episode? I said, yes, I did. <laughs> was it. that true or false? <laughs> it, was true. it was true. He called it. He said, yeah, that was a good one. Has it been hard to cross lines? I mean, genre-wise? Because I know there is a tendency sometimes in the business to pigeonhole people and say, you're a comedy guy, you're a drama guy. So have you found it hard? I mean, not at this point, because you've proven yourself, but when you wanted to bounce around, did you find it? Initially? Yes, I think it's always hard and, and it's very hard. Uh, they love pigeonholing you. Um, you make that living that you were talking about in the beginning, you make it a better living when you stick to one thing. Mm -hmm. because they know you do comedy and they you, they can go to you. They know you do drama. They know you do action. And it's easy for them to think about it. I've worked hard that they will come to me for almost anything now, which is great. And when I'm producing, I can, I can cross over and I can make things, you know, I can go to the stunts and the action. I can go to the comedy. I like trying to find out putting them all together anyway. I love sitcoms. I love hours. I love, you know, films. So 
I love your enthusiasm. I mean, it's like you're you're so gen. I mean, because honestly, a lot of people who have a career with the you know longevity that you do are a little cynical about their work. You know, they don't still feel that same you know rush of excitement, which you clearly do, which I still clearly do when I approach my work. And it's really nice to see because I imagine that it makes for a much happier set to have someone who's you know coming yeah. that every day, going, "Wow, I'm I'm getting to do this, and look what I can learn, and look what I can do." You know, it's funny because my daughter just directed um, her first, you know, one of her first shows and she yeah. came to me after working for about two, three weeks and, you know, I could see her exhausted. It was so much fun watching her come in with the shoulders hunched up and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> a lot of fun, huh? And she, said, she said, Daddy, they came up to me and said, um, we liked the fact you knew what you wanted to do. We liked you, the fact that you weren't a screamer. We liked the fact that you got us out on time. And I said, hey, you're just like your dad. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, you know, all those things are important. Knowing what you want, being calm, because you don't, you know, when you, when you get riled, the whole set will get riled. You know, it's, it's keeping your focus. So, and yeah. I like I enjoy myself. I have fun. Well, I think that's the point. I mean, you know, I, I feel personally blessed that telling stories is part of what I do for a living. And I, I feel like, uh, you know, you it should be fun. You know, we yeah. should approach it with that kind of joy. Um, so I read a quote where that you said that you thought the key to achieving longevity was is being well rounded. Um, so is that why you work across genre? I mean, I think you talked about that a little before why you talked about how you went to sort of ground yourself in your roots of theater every now and then. But do, can you expand upon that a little bit about uh, achieving being well rounded is also having a variety of friends a lot of times, you know, I, like I said, I've got doctors and lawyers and I remember I was doing Chicago Hope once and my family was out of town. I was home by myself and a friend called up and said, Oz, you want to come up for dinner? And I said, okay. And I walk into a house full of, it had to be seven doctors and me. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, I'm here and I'm doing this doctor show. And I told him I was doing a doctor show, a Chicago Hope where a 350 pound man was having a procedure. He has a heart attack and they're taking him on the elevator to the OR to, to operate because he's having a heart attack and the, the elevator gets stuck. And they said, and so they have to do the operation on the elevator. And oh my God, it, you can't do an operation on the elevator. You can't do this, that <laughs> procedure. Yes, it does happen. Cause I had, there was two cardiologists there and our, we have our procedure room next to OR because that could happen. And then one doctor said, well, our procedure room is on a different floor than our OR. And then they said, yeah, but the elevator, elevator is the dirtiest place in the, in the whole hospital because of the updrafts and all the dust and dirt going through there. And somebody said, hey, if he's dying, you gotta, you gotta cut. Mm -hmm. you know, just having those things in my head when I did it, it helped me to really think about it in a whole different way than just doing an operation in the elevator. Realizing, yeah, updraft, the dirt in there, the, right. you know, yeah. this whole thing, you know, getting them from one floor to another. And so being well-rounded for me is, is knowing more than just television and film. It's also knowing what other people are doing, what lawyers do. I talk to lawyers all the time about things. You know, David Kelly, who was one of our greatest writers, was um, Michael Crichton. I mean, mm. a friend of mine walked across the stage with Michael Crichton at Harvard Medical School when Michael Crichton and him graduated together. Oh, no. <laughs> and Michael Crichton said, I'm not going to hang up a shingle. But, you know, but he had something to draw from. Mm -hmm. Wrote his stories. You could see the beginnings of it were very science heavy, but about characters, about people. So that for me is being well-rounded, is not, is not saying I saw a TV show where they did it this way. I totally agree with you. Having taught at film school, uh, you know, not at NYU for that long, but at other schools as well, 
um, you know, the, I really see that having a little life experience really informs writers, directors, everyone, you know, having, you, you have to have something to say. And, and we're, when you're just beginning, you have to accumulate experiences so that you have something to talk about. Besides yeah, and, 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 and being well-rounded and knowing, having your comedy, having your action, having this, you know, it's, it's for me, when I did my second year on the Jeffersons, they said, Oz, we're just trying to get from 10th year to 11, 11 years and our actors are getting bored. Mm. And your job is to inspire them, which is what, and so I, when I got the 11th season, it was like, oh, you, you did your job, Oz. But I went, to, I went to Isabel and I said, I want to do Lucille Ball. And, and, and here's an interesting thing that when I was offered the Jeffersons, they were doing 24 episodes a season. Wow. And I said, I only want to do 20. Hmm. I said, what are you talking about? You want to give up four episodes? Yes. I want to be able to go off at any time and do something else. And they looked at me like I was absolutely out of my mind. So for two seasons, I did 40 episodes of the Jeffersons, 20 and 20. And Alice called up and said, does Oz want to do an episode of Alice? Ralph Wade was doing the Mississippi, which was an hour show. So, I mean, I went off and I would do those things. For me, it kept me fresh. Right, right. as opposed to working on one show and thinking about one thing. Yeah, that's... Yeah. And doing the same camera angles after a while gets me bored. But, but you know, I was doing something with Martha Ray on, on, on Alice and I said, I, I could do, you know, when that something came up, I said, wait a second, I did something on Alice that we could translate to the Jeffersons for Isabel to do. You know, um, and for me, and for me, comedy is an inherent part of drama anyway. You know, it's like there's a line that Nzizaki has, you know, you got to laugh to keep from crying. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. I always say that, uh, you know, the true comedy comes from recognizing the pain underneath it. Yeah. And, and what the, I believe. I'm always saying to actors is stop playing the emotion of the words. The words got the emotion. Why do you have to add to, the, to that? Mm -hmm. I want to see something else. I mean, the people who scare me the most are those people who laugh and smile and you say they shouldn't be laughing and smile. They know some I don't know. <laughs> now I'm going to be self-conscious every time I laugh or smile, I'm going <laughs> to put a curse on. <laughs> but, but think about it. It's, 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 we live, we, we do things to throw people off. We do things to protect ourselves. We Absolutely. do things. And what are those things? If, if, if it says they sob, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, okay. <laughs> But the words are sobbing. Why do you have to sob? Let's right. see what else. What else? Thing that's sobbing. And what do people really do? That, because you bringing it back to something that you said at the very top of our discussion, it's about the specificity of detail, right? Exactly. That's what illuminates the human condition, right? Yeah. Is finding those specific details that really can make someone individual and real as a character. Yeah, yeah. So I read that your personal philosophy is go with the flow. And um, which is an excellent philosophy, by the way. But I was wondering if it's changed at all during the pandemic, um, or if it's just like you've doubled down on that during the pandemic. <laughs> I, hey, you know, it's funny because I'm working on a show and, and they were taking a while to get my offer out. And I said, what, what's the problem? And they said, well, they're trying to figure out a budget for COVID. I said, you can't. <laughs> it is what it's going to be. I said, the, our, our shows are now, they're shutting down for two days here, a week here, two weeks here. You know, what are you going to do? Take money away from the production to cover your COVID expenses? No, you're not, you can't do it because I can only shoot a, a show in so many days. And if you want to take away days, you're just not going to get it. Right. And the one thing I tell everybody, it's, it's not the money you spend, but it's the work you put out there because if, if that work is great and that work can keep pulling people in, that's what they're looking for. If you do a bad show just because you don't have enough money, that's your, that's on you. You're the one who's going to get blamed. It's interesting because you said that, you know, before that the thing you like least are the limitations. And this is just another set of limitations that, you know, are impossible to predict 
pretty onerous, expensive. I get it from all perspectives, but on the whole, you know, as an artist, I agree with you. If you're not delivering something that's going to draw an audience, why bother in the first place? You know, there's no point that's in right. doing the half-ass stuff. Yeah, and it's, it's something to be very careful. Ivan Dixon was a um, wonderful actor, wonderful director, told me once that they came to him once and said, Ivan, the show's going to die. We can. We only have six days. Can you help save us money and get through it really quick? And he said, "Okay." And so he was like, "Okay, roll on, action, cut, print. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move." He told me he was up for another show a, co a couple months later, and the word came down. Didn't he do that terrible episode? That's all they remembered. They didn't Everybody remember that they fast and screwed himself, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we just said, just watch yourself, be careful. Right. Well, also good advice. I mean, you know, there's always these tensions, right? Money and art, you know, that's what the tension is and what we do. But I think that, uh, you know, you have to really fight for the, to deliver the quality. Otherwise you're, you know, hamstringing yourself from that. Right. So, um, so I wanted to go back a minute to why you decided to go get an MFA um, back when you did. What was your decision about going back to school and getting an MFA and becoming part of the beautiful NYU family? Oh, wow. You would have to ask that. Um, why did I get an MFA? Because I was walking down the street one day and a friend came out and I was driving a cab and I was doing odd jobs and a friend came out and said, hey, Oz, they're auditioning for... NYU had a directing program in the theater then. They're auditioning for directors, you know, directing program. And so I went in and I said, I want to audition for the directing program. And they looked at me and they said, okay, we have an appointment this afternoon around 3.30. You need to bring a play in that you've directed to show us. And I said, could you give me till tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> You did and not. Said, you okay. found out something to direct and overnight? Is that what you're telling yes. me? <laughs> yes. Yes. And I brought it in the next day. I think they skipped two or three pages. It was a small script I had uh, written and they accepted me. But, you know, I went to NYU. I, I, I wanted to stay off the street. I needed something to do, you know. And there's sometimes I think the problem being in New York is there's so much happening in New York mm. um, that sometimes I, I said, well, if I'd gone to Yale, I'd gone, you know, where there's nothing other than school. Mm -hmm. But for me, New York was just full at the time. I mean, there was so much happening. I ended up stage managing my entire second year at the public theater mm -hmm. while I was at NYU. And I'd run into my classes and I'd run back out and I would be doing this and I'd be doing that. And um, head of the design department, the stage managing class was under his and they had a stage managing class at six o'clock on a Friday night. That's just cruel and unusual punishment. Right it now. was, it was. And the teacher and I made a plan that Saturday morning, because I was off stage managing Friday night for Joe Pat. I mean, what else could, you know? So Saturday mornings, I would be at his office. He was a big Broadway stage manager. And we would talk for an hour or two every Saturday morning. At the end of the semester, um, I found out I had an F. And I went to the administrator. And I said, wait a second, why did I get an F? And she said, Oz, Oz, we're working it out right now. The teacher gave you an A. The head of the department gave you an F because you didn't because of your attendance. And you can you'll get a you got a C. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so how much grades matter? Oh, I didn't say that. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. they matter. Um, so uh, so what has surprised you about the most about the way your career has unfolded? Um, what has surprised me or what, yeah. when I look back at it, what would I have done different? Um, yeah, I mean, either of those. I mean, I guess like starting from like when you graduated and you have your MFA, obviously you had certain ideas about where your career was going to go or certain hopes, right? So I guess the question is, you know, no, no hopes, no <laughs> dreams, just like 
bouncing from one thing to the next, like the vagabond you are. Okay, I see how it is. All right. Come on, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not going to be, you know, I, I was a guy. I was this, I was a guy. I was a kid. I was like, wow, let's see what else is out there. I mean, I was, you know, I wasn't thinking about family or, you know, or nesting or any of that. It was just fun. I mean, what did I expect? I don't know what I expected. You know, I thought maybe I'd be a stage manager for, you know, a while. You know, it, here's the one thing I always say to somebody, you know, people sit there and say, how did you become a director? And I, I remember Nancy Baker was a, a editor that I worked with who I worked with on that film in New Orleans. Um, Nancy had done Harlan County USA. And I said to Nancy once, I said, Nancy, how do I become a director? And she told me, go out and tell everybody you're a director until somebody believes you. <laughs> At which point you're gonna have to prove it. <laughs> but well, I, think I think it was- One of the beautiful things and one of the terrifying things about you know, the business is that anyone can decide they're a director or a producer or a writer. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean they have the chops or the ability to do any of those jobs, but you, you, know, you can go to school, you don't have to, you can just declare it. Yeah, and so I did until um, I was introduced to Antezaki Shange by her sister, who was a friend of mine, who had never seen anything I directed. But she said, uh, Zaki, this is Oz. He's a director. And it was sort of like, OK, here are my poems. Make a play out of them. You're a director, uh, which is where, you know, where that transition began. Um, so. Yeah, magic happens. And I think you, but you got to be ready. You got to be prepared. You can't just, one of the things I tell actors when they come, come from New York to LA or come wherever, I said, you, you got to stay up on your craft because when it happens, you get one shot. You don't get two, you don't get three, you get one shot. And even if you do get two, you got to think that you're only going to get one shot because they're going to look at you. Because when I came to, to LA, there was a bunch of actors who I thought were absolutely brilliant when we were in New York, who had gone on to waiting tables just to survive. Mm -hmm. And two or three years later, when I got to a point where I could start bringing them in, I would bring them in and their craft was rusty. And the producers would look at me and said, uh, what was I gonna say? Oh, in New York, they were great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can't, I couldn't say that. So I always tell people, you know, like I had one like great- Right. Yes. And I actually will take acting classes once in a while just to, to keep myself aware because there's times as a director, you get frustrated with an actor and say, why can't they get it? And sometimes I'll just act it out and I'll say, oh, it's, it's a tongue twister. No wonder they can't get it or, or the emotion is not there or the transition's not there. So, you know, in one of my acting classes, they said, right, do something. You know, you, you, you can't act every single day, but you can write every single day. You have to do something to keep your craft up, keep your brain sharp. So when you you get that chance, you jump, jump in there and you blow it out, you know, blow it out the water. I think that's excellent advice. Um, so when we last spoke, when I invited you to come do this, you told me you were putting a dream deal together. And I wanted to know. Uh -oh. That's okay. That's the other problem. Lawyers, lawyers. Come together. Lawyers, lawyers. And was it, did it happen yet? Can you tell us? There is still no, no. But the problem is the lawyers are still going at it with each other. You know the details. I mean, when I when Norman Lear brought me to, Norman Lear asked me to do a black soap opera. To to put together a black soap opera, and I was like, yeah, great, let's go. I'm ready. I came to L.A two months the lawyers took to talk you know one lawyer was on a vacation another lawyer and then they were like oh we're gonna get i'm in the middle of that right now yeah the lawyers they'll kill us all yes. um so uh, you're working now you said you're in nola you're uh, down yeah. in nola yeah i'm in new orleans working on um uh, a law show paula Patton is a entertainment lawyer and working on that i just did swat you know i'm hoping to go i'm coming to new york to do a show and you know it's jumping around how are you finding the work in the COVID environment how's that been it's crazy because i was i was 
I was doing SWAT and I, I was talking to this actress and you just sitting there like, <laughs> and I looked at her, she kept going, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then I said, you don't hear me, do you? <laughs> she said, no, I don't. <laughs> So, you know, that that's one thing. And then it was so funny because I, I had a cup of coffee on the set and I pulled my mask down to drink it. And she said, oh my God, that's the first time I've seen your face. Oh, wow. You know, and I think our faces give a lot of emotion off. And sometimes I find in directing, they can look at me and say, I got it, I got it, Oz. You don't have to say anything, you know. But having a mask, it's hard. And I've talked to a bunch of actors who say, because I said, we got to rehearse with masks on until we get ready to roll. And they said, but Oz, how do you rehearse with somebody with a mask on? It's hard. And it is hard. It's hard. Yeah. It's things you have to do. Okay. It's, it's a different world. Has there been any COVID lemonade, as I like to say? Any advantages that you've I think um, the show's... There's a lot of shows that are only letting us work 10, 11 hours, no more than that. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting as much work, if not just, you know, because when you work 14 hours, 15 hours, it's draining in those last two to three hours, yeah. it just, it drops. But to think that when you're doing 10 hours that you come to work at eight in the morning, you go home at six, I mean, just think of the rest that you get. The crew gets rest. I think that's something that I think is going to stick around for for a while. I think, I, I mean, I hope so. I mean, you know, it's always been the balance of time versus money, but I feel like, you know, th that's also led to, you know, safety issues and driving issues. And, you know, I've worked 18 hour days too on set and you are, it depletes you. It doesn't, everyone's work is affected. So maybe the part of the health, uh, uh, requirements will also just cause us to look at, you know, safety and, you know, crew health in a larger way. Maybe that, yeah. you know, yeah. that could uh, lemonade. So there are those positives, um, but there's, you know, the, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, I have a, I'm going to start going to some questions from the audience. We have a question from Julie Branson, who says, I grew up watching many of these TV shows. I guess there are a list of before. You contributed to my view of African-American life. How do you feel about your contribution to how African-Americans were portrayed? Do you have a favorite episode or any of any that you regret? Uh, uh, regrets are more, I had a bad script and I couldn't make it any better. I mean, but I think that you know, I think there was an interesting, speaking from an African-American point of view, there was an interesting episode of The Practice that I did, um, I think it was called The Means, where we were getting ready to shoot it. Dylan McDermott was the lawyer and the defense he was gonna use was the Idi Amin defense. And Idi Amin was a black lawyer in LA during the riots who the defense was no matter the socioeconomic level of the black person involved in this, in a riot, they just tend to, to fall into whatever, into that mass hysteria. And so that was his defense. And he got up there, we rehearsed it. And I remember Steve Harris, the black lawyer, started laughing. And Dylan said, what are you laughing at? And he said, Dylan, you had a lot of black fans. <laughs> You're gonna lose a lot of black fans from this one. <laughs> Dylan looked at him and we went off. We we um, we um, lit it, came back, and Dylan was like, you know, Oz, I've been looking at this scene and, and I, I think I've got a concern about this scene. <laughs> and so we 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 and I'm like, Dylan, I'm lit, I'm ready, you know. I mean it, it's it, it was an interesting, it was an interesting, it was an interesting episode. And I, I, I actually liked the episode a lot because it, it was a, a black lawyer, a black businessman, a, you know, from a fortune 500 who gets accosted by a police office, you know, a police um, in this department store. And he ends up throwing the guy through the plate glass window. So there was a lot of issues. And, and for me, as an African-American director, 
I'm very, I don't want to say careful. I, I, um, I'm very outspoken, you know, and I, 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 I'll do a lot of shows where I'm like going, I remember one show and it was one comedy I, I was doing, Morris Day was in it and, and Morris had a line in it. And I said, where he used the word impotent. I think I'm impotent. And at the end of the read through, I saw Morris come at me and I said, Morris, don't worry, I got this one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have to say what he was going to say. And I said to the, I said to the writers and to the execs, I said, he can't use the word. He don't know how to use the word. He can't <laughs> use the word, you know? <laughs> and they were like, but Oz, but Oz. And then I remember the head, head of the studio said, but Oz, I have a friend who said he was, uh, oh, I see, yeah, I see the point. <laughs> But, you know, but there's times that, you know, I bring myself to, to the work and I, 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 I try to find out how to inform, inform situations, you know, and I, I, I want to inform it. I remember Peter Berg and I were doing with Rocky Carroll of, of Chicago Hope, where there was a 12 year old gangbanger and, and, and Peter Berg was the doctor and he wanted to go and the gangbanger, this 12 year old had threatened him with a gun. So he was gonna go to his apartment. And so he ends up going into Cabrini Green and, 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 and Rocky, Rocky Carroll, I said to Rocky, you know, I said, Rocky, Rocky was saying, um, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. And, and Peter Berg's line is, yes, I do. He said, he said, I know what I'm doing. He said, no, 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 no. It wasn't a question. It wasn't a question. <laughs> But you know, I, I'm. I think there's 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 nuances, there's details, and for me, I love bringing all that to my work, you know. And, and there's times where I'll fight for a black actor to to do a part, you know. I remember it was a show it was, again. It was Chicago Hope, I think, where I hired. You know, we were holding off. There was a couple. We were holding off picking the child until we figured out pick the parents. And we had said, let's have white parents come in and black parents come in and we'll figure it out. And the two best actors, one was, was Wayne Duvall, who was a white guy, and one was um, a black woman. And I looked at everybody and said, guys, they're the two best actors. And we hired them and it was so much, it was so great because by the time we ended the episode, they were actually divorcing in the, in the episode. They had such great chemistry. They, they changed the ending and made them stay together. <laughs> I, I think this is something that you, you know, you bring and you want to find, you know, I mean, there's, yeah. there's positive, there's negatives, you know, and I'm, and the one thing I'm going to say that I really keep saying this a lot is I tell writers, you can't protect your, characters you can't write them nice you got to write them honest mm -hmm. and in their honesty we can accept them for who they are they may be bad people but we we want to see we want to know why they do what they do and right. that's what i think is that's about. isn't that what brings us you know relate help helps us relate to characters it's like yeah. i always say you want to create empathy for your characters create situations that put them and you in a state of anxiety and then provide the catharsis. I mean, I think that in the most elemental level, that's what good storytelling is, but it has to begin with us caring about those characters. And that's where it goes back to what you were saying before about just being specific and, yeah. and hiring the best actor, always. And to, and to that question, if I have a problem, it's more with men who don't know how to write women. You know, I said, I'm read, I read a script once and I said, I, you may know this woman, but I don't. <laughs> I mean, that might be your fantasy, but get over it, guys. <laughs> There's not a real person over there. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another question from the audience. This is from Alberto Anaya. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, 
forgive me if I didn't. When it comes to looking for a composer, hiring a composer, do you also go for the comedy or person or the drama person or the genre person? Or do you also look across genres? Uh, I, I love looking across the genres. Um, I think that um, I used um, John Addison for a Disney movie. I did Mr. Boogity, which is a comedy. Now, John Addison had done Charge of the Light Brigade, the sec that second one. John Addison was this major English composer. And, and he brought so much to, and I remember one time that John said, Oz, pump the music, pump the music, pump the music. And I said, but I can't hear the words. He said, Oz, just try it once. And, you know, the, I think great composers, I'm looking, can, can find the comedy, they can find the drama. I said, a lot of comedy, there's drama in there and there's a lot of drama there's there's those comic moments that make you you know that can make you cry that can make you you know laugh that can distract you i mean you know and if we're talking composers i worked with one composer oh that they put on me because he was cheap who, who i mean i think i did an entire course if i took my emails i could have published a book on composing because he was following the beats of the actors Oh. And the music would hit, and I was like, guy, I don't know what to listen to, your music or the actors. I said, you are punctuation, you are punctuation. You are sitting there yeah. taking it to another level. You're not supposed to be doing the same thing the actors are doing, as I'm telling the actors, you're not supposed to be doing the same thing the words are doing. <laughs> right. So um, have you had any pandemic guilty pleasures? Have you watched, read, or listened to anything that you would recommend? I mean, yeah, it's been it's been it's been fun watching a lot of films, a lot of um, shows. Do I have any guilty pleasures? Ah, no, but I mean, I've watched more television than I've watched in <laughs> years during this whole thing. You know, I don't think you're alone in that, Oz. Actually, but uh, <laughs> I think we've all been pretty big consumers. But then, like, you know, I go to bed, and my wife said, "I'll tell my wife turn the TV off. I can't stand it anymore." You know, so, you know, it's, 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 I think the pandemic has been very interesting for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. I think that's an understatement. I think that it's been very challenging and, uh, you know, I think that, you know, well, I personally sort of rotate between watching, reading and listening because different, different kinds of stimulation, but. Um, all right, so we're gonna let you go off into your evening. I have one last question. I wanna thank you again for being so generous with your time and, so candid with your answers, um, but what is the best piece of advice you would give people who are, have, have an aspiration uh, to, to be you, who would like to have a long career directing, a long, rich, diverse career? What, what, what would you advise them? You know, I, I, for me, I think those, the 10, 10, 12 years I spent at the O'Neill working with writers on, on plays I think helped tremendously working with actors on creating those. You know, I tell a lot of people do salons. You can bring people in your living room right now. You can do it on Zoom where you can read through plays and, and you can listen and talk. I had a, I had a, at one, one school, I, a, a directing student came up to me and said, is there a directing book that you would recommend? And I, so I looked at him and I said, what's the last play you read? Mm. And they were, uh, I said, why don't you start there? Mm -hmm. so, so what I'm always saying is you got to keep working. You got to keep trying. You got to keep experimenting. You got to, you know, the people who make it are those people who get the opportunity create your own opportunity. And, and right now with, with cameras and video and, and with so much, you have so much technology. Yes, when I was doing For Color Girls, we started in a, in a bar on the Lower East Side and we were, you know, I, I saw it first with, you know, we, would, we did it in basements. We did it wherever we could do it. We did it the, in, a, in, a, in a hall at, at Yale. That was one of our first performances. I, you just got to get out there and keep doing it, working with the actors, working with directors, working with 
musicians, composers, where's, where, you know, I keep saying what's happening with the pandemic is making us look at a lot of things differently. Mm -hmm. Looking at theater in a whole different way. Absolutely. And a lot of these things have been coming. And it's actually forced it to come a lot faster. I mean, they've been, you know, I thought Hamilton, I enjoyed actually the Disney version of Hamilton, you know, because it's how do we do these things? You know, you've got writers, you've got people. It's like find those people, work with those people and come up with stuff, create stuff. And don't look for anybody to help you because ain't nobody gonna help you. Because guess what? Nobody cares except you. So, you know, you and your friends and your people, like I, some, some parents have come to me and say, my, my, my kid wants to um, do a film. My kid wants to do this. What, what do you think that, how can I help them? I said, the only way you can help them is give them some money and help them do it. <laughs> you know? That on the back and uh, yeah, a little support, right? But I want to tell you, if you wait for it to happen, it ain't gonna happen. You got to figure out how to make it happen for yourself. And a couple of people I've, I've talked to, when they look back at their careers, they said, I wish I had a partner. Mm -hmm. you know, because just remember, this is a business. Mm -hmm. There is a whole business, you know I mean? The one thing I tried to make sure was I never lost anybody any money. Because that's the Another first- philosophy. <laughs> that's the first thing that'll keep you from ever working again. Um, and so for me, it's like, and I, I just love experimenting with crossing genres and crossing this and, you know, and seeing where it goes, you know, uh, look at, you know, one of the biggest money makers is, is, is paranormal activity. I mean, they did it for no money and they made millions and millions. You don't know where it's going to come from, you know, right. horror, comedy, you know, what is it, what is it you do right? What do you do the best? And write and write. And guess what? It doesn't have to be good. It really doesn't. It just needs to keep stimulating. I think, that I think you, you churn out a lot of bad stuff before you start making good stuff. And I think that's part of the process is actually. And don't rewrite the same script over and over <laughs> again for 10 years because. That's a terrible idea. Yes. It is. Because you won't learn because after you, you know, I look at Shakespeare every six months, he had another play out and he right. just kept growing and growing. Putting us all to shame that will. Yeah. It's prolific writing. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much, Oz. It's really been a pleasure. I, I look forward to sitting down in person on the other side of this, preferably with cocktails involved. Um, but I really thank you again for your time and generosity and uh, for joining us for tonight. And I'm, I'm sure that you inspired a lot of people I see in the comments, a lot of thanks so that are beyond mine. So thank you again for joining us. And um, this is uh, NYU Discovery Sessions signing off. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye.